Hello, hello, and welcome to Greece Public Library's Book Break. I'm Kirstra. I'm one of the librarians here. I moderate our Pints and Prose book discussion group, and I am joined, as always, by my colleague, Claire. Hello, everyone. I'm Claire. I do the Historical Fiction Book Club on Facebook and also as the page turns um, and love doing these book things with Kirstra. Um, so today we have a theme, uh, but it's a little bit different. Um, today we are going to talk to you about books we did not like. <laughs> right. The two thumbs down books. So Yeah, seriously. But so here's the thing is that um, I know that at least one of the books that Claire is talking about, I really liked. Um, I know that some of the books that I'm going to talk about have been very popular. So as with every book that we talk about, your mileage may vary. Um, and if you've read any of these books and you liked them, we would love to hear about why, like we mm -hmm. wanna talk about it. Um, so I have a stack, I think I have like five books. Me too. Okay, perfect. So why don't you start and we will just dive right in. All right, the first one I'm gonna talk about is The Book That Matters Most hmm. by Ann Hood. Um, read this for as the page turns book club and some of my members love this book. Um, I hated it because <laughs> the one main thing to me, it was uh, it was supposed to be about women and a book club and the books they read that actually affect their lives. And the main character really didn't really feel like reading any of the books. And I was just like, I'm not okay with this. <laughs> and then um, the, the daughter goes on a rampage in Europe ends up as a heroin addict is miraculously cured at the end and I just found it too implausible mm. uh, especially about the drug use it really bothered me because that is such a, a horrible thing for so many people and that they fight for their lives and with her it was just like boom done you know <laughs> yeah so that's uh that was my hmm. summation of the book that matters most. But uh, like I said, some people in my book club related to the characters, loved them, mm -hmm. loved their struggles, which there were a lot of struggles, marriage, divorce, mm -hmm. drug use, grief, suicide, you know, the whole gamut was in there. So sure. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Nice. Yeah. Um, I almost picked one that we talked about in our Pints and Prose group, but I I did not. I was just double checking my stack. So I'm going to start with one um, that I read for our Spring into the Classics challenge a couple of years ago. And that is The Call of the Wild by Jack London. I hated this book. It is <laughs> like, it's barely a book. It's like a novella. Um, it is, okay, in print, it is 62 pages long. Um, I listened to this one in audio. It was, I want to say like a four hour audio book. And I had to take a break in the middle, like two hours in, I had to turn it off yeah. like a week because it was bothering me so much. So um, if there's anyone who is not familiar with the plot of Call of the Wild, um, it is about a dog um, who is born in um, California, like kind of in the Central Valley, has a very nice cushy life. Um, and this puppy gets stolen and like sold away from his home and ends up as a sled dog in Alaska. And so I had a couple of problems with this book. The first one, it's like dog torture porn. Oh. Um, like so many dogs end up injured or dead. It's like, I, this is not how I want to spend my time is listening to about people abusing dogs. And then the other piece. So uh, my understanding is that it's supposed to be some like deep ex like exploration of how, you know, we have a fundamental nature that is, you know, the wild and we are more or less like at our best truest selves when we allow that wildness to come out, which is like <laughs> BS in my opinion. I was like, no, like, of course this dog would have been happier living a pampered life on a farm in the Central Valley of California, not having to burrow a hole in the snow so that he could sleep and not freeze to death overnight. Come on, give me a yeah. break. So call of the wild. 
a miss for me. <laughs> well, my second one is the dilemma when you read a book by an author and you love it, and then you're so eagerly awaiting their next book. Mm. And then it's a big old flopperoo. <laughs> Let me introduce you to <laughs> The Mermaid Chair by Sue Monk Kidd. <laughs> Um, I read The Secret Life of Bees and just loved it, you know? So The Mermaid Chair, I started reading this one and it's just the typical, you know, woman having a midlife crisis and she goes to a place where there are, I read this a long time ago, so mm. you'll have to bear with me. Um, there are lots of monks. Of course, she falls in love with one of the monks, you know, Why not? this is her love you know, just her family falls apart all for this dream of being herself and loving this monk who mm -hmm. I think they, they don't end up being together, but he ends up breaking his vows. And I was just like, mm. what, what, <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't know. It just really just flopped for me. And um, yeah. Yeah. Didn't she also write um, the invention of wings? Yes, but I like that one. See, um, and I didn't. I didn't oh, love okay. it. Okay, so. I didn't love it. I've yeah. never liked any of them as much as The Secret Life of Bees, but I at least okay. felt like I garnered something and learned about some people in sure. um, The Invention of Wings, whereas sure. this one, I just wanted to forget it as soon as <laughs> I, I read it. So there, there we have it. All right. Um, so my next one... Uh, was an international bestseller. I've got to check and see when this came out. 1992. I probably read this one almost 20 years ago. Um, and that is The Secret History by Donna Tart. I didn't like it either. <laughs> <laughs> um, so th <laughs> this one is um, about, so the main character is um, a college student. He moves from, again, from California to the Northeast to one of these sort of um, rarefied uh, bastions of education. Um, so, you know, meant to be like a Harvard or a Yale. I was gonna say, um, we're not allowed to say Harvard, but, but no, there you go. Yeah. Right. Um, and falls in with this um, group of students who study Greek and he's like just in love with all of them. And it turns out they're up to like some shady business. Um, and he gets all pulled into their shady business. And there's a professor who is like, um, so this is like, <laughs> um, what's the the Robin Williams movie? Um, oh God, I've lost the name of it. Oh, Captain, my captain, where he's the teacher. Yeah, I can see him, school. see him in the classroom, but. What? Oh my God. Anyway, this is like that movie, except if the Robin Williams character had been like, trying to convince all of his students to just completely go off the rails, just kind of to see what would happen. But everyone is terrible and they do terrible things. <laughs> Especially to that one poor guy. Yeah, so <sighs> yeah. Yeah, and that one is on a lot of lists. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, some people really like it. So. It is. And the Goldfinch, her book that came out just fairly recently within the last four or five years, won the Pulitzer Prize. Right. I've not yeah. been tempted to pick it up, I got to tell you. No, no, it's too massive a tome for me. Yeah. It's the kind of thing I think you have to be in the mood for. And mm -hmm. I just haven't found myself in the mood for it. Maybe because I go. didn't like that one. <laughs> well, right. Yeah. All right. My next one is by an author you probably know as the Time Traveler's Wife author, mm. Audrey Niffenegger. I'm mm -hmm. surprised we still had this baby on the shelf, actually. <laughs> it's called Her Fearful Symmetry. And I was really excited about this one because it, it's mostly set in um, Highgate Cemetery in London. Mm. So I was okay. really anticipating maybe some creepiness, but a lot of um, history and everything about the cemetery. But her characters are just these in particular it's like two different sets of twins um mm -hmm. a mother and her sister who are you know estranged and then the sister dies in london and leaves her flat to these twins of her sister mm. um but she describes them as 
even though they're in their 20s, is almost you you almost feel like they're 12 years old with their little matching hmm. backpacks. And I don't know, the whole thing was just so weird to me and gave off a weird vibe. And that was one of the things I didn't like about the time traveler's wife either with the, the hmm. flashbacks when he went mm-hmm. into Claire's life. And I don't know, just wasn't comfortable with it. So this one, I just felt like it got so strange at the end. It was like, why am I reading this? But I, I had to, because I, I, I really had to f- find out how it ended, but mm-hmm. um, yeah, you have people switching identities, ghosts running around, you hmm. know, plot twists, but it just didn't gel for me and just was pretty weird. So, fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. I guess some another reviewer said it, read it and said, been there, done that. Ooh, gross. And that was about <laughs> how I felt as well. So, there you go. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. I like it. Um, Okay, my next one, I'm just going in order of the stack that I have in front of me. Um, So this is another one. Uh, This is a Man Booker Prize winner. Um, It's like extremely critically acclaimed. Um, It is Wolf Hall by Mm. Hilary Mantel. Um, It is the first book in her trilogy about Thomas Cromwell. Um, And it was such a slog. It took me so long to get through this book. I mean, it's not a short book. It's almost 600 pages. Um, But I like historical fiction. I like that period, um, you know, the Tudor period. Um, But oh my God, like there should have been so much intrigue and drama and it felt like nothing happened for 600 pages. Um, And it was also the way it's written. Um, Like I had trouble keeping track of like who was talking and whose point of view we were in. And I would have to go back and like reread pages to try and figure out what was actually going on, which I mean, nothing kills your reading buzz faster than having to go back and reread a page three times because you can't figure out what's happening. Who's talking, yeah. yeah, so like people just gush and gush about this book and I did not like it. What, didn't isn't like it. it a TV series now? Um, oh, I wouldn't be surprised. Or a movie, yeah. Probably TV know. series. Yeah. I mean, like, a, and the TV series I would probably like because they right. get to all of that action and drama and intrigue. Right, and cut, um, all, the, cut all the bad parts. The, <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of that. Yeah. <laughs> My next one was another book club pick, I believe. And mm. a lot of people um, like this. It's one of the thriller genres. It's Defending Jacob by William Landay, um, who is an attorney. Mm-hmm. So I just got so irritated with the main character, <laughs> it's Andy Barber, and he his just complete denial about what an evil person his son is and just excuse mm. after excuse after excuse. So the characters for me were a little bit too one-dimensional. Like mm-hmm. Jacob was just so inherently evil and his father was just, he just was allowing him to, to get away with things, even though mm-hmm. he knew, you know, that he was guilty. Um, a lot of comparisons to presumed innocent, you know, I guess, cause two attorneys, mm-hmm. courtroom thriller. I, I didn't feel his courtroom scenes and anything were, as good as some of the other attorney writers that I've read. Sure. So um, this one, I saw other comparisons to like the bad seed. And, and that is kind of how I felt because it was, <laughs> okay. like, you know, and after he gets away with one thing, they go away on vacation, of course, to get away with it. And then, you know, something else horrible happens that the kid is probably, you know, is responsible for. So mm. you just want to <laughs> shake these people and go, what in the name of God were you thinking? You know, I don't know. Didn't work for me. Okay. Um, so just totally unbelievable as far as my believability meter. Mm-hmm. Um, father just obtuse, you know, just, just, yeah. oh, I, I can't forgive you for that. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, so, oh, and I, another I, reviewer said the characters are about as flat as the paper dolls I paid with as ooh. a child. Ooh, ouch. 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 So, not my um, words, but yeah, I pretty much agree. 
Nice. Um, so that one is also a TV series, I want to say on Apple Plus. And mm-hmm. I want to say it's got Jude Law, maybe, as the lead. Someone like high profile. Well, who wouldn't want to watch Jude Law, you know? Well, but, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Be yeah, giving that one a miss too. I'm guessing. Yeah, and the th- well, the thing <laughs> is, is it could be a good TV series. Mm-hmm. It could be one of those rare things where you say, "Well, the TV series is better than the book." Type mm-hmm. of thing. So yeah. Um, oh, interestingly enough, I just realized that my last two books are also have been adapted to the uh, TV series. Mm. So that's interesting. So my next one, I actually picked up because I watched the first season of the series and I was interested and I was like, oh, let me read the book because I'm sure it's gonna give me like that extra depth, Um, but no. So that is- (laughs) Well, I knew you were gonna- (laughs) By Lev Grossman. Um, So the premise, if you're not familiar with the book or the show, um, is interesting and it seems like it should be right up my alley. So our main character is Quentin Coldwater he is um, kind of a mopey dude. Um, he, let's see, he was a like high school math genius, but kind of you know depressed, withdrawn, and he's obsessed with this series of children's books about a magical land called Fillory um, that you can get to from our world. So it's very much got like um, a Narnia vibe to it. Yeah. Like, people moving back and forth between Fillory and the the real world. And, you know, magic is there and it's this enchanted fantasy world, right? So um, Quentin uh, gets, finds out like unexpectedly, he gets accepted to the Break Bills College of Magic. So it's also got like that Harry Potter, Mm -hmm. uh, you're a wizard, Harry, like, Secretly, you are this special, special person, right? And he gets admitted to this school that is very much like Hogwarts, except it's college level instead of primary school. Um, So like all of the elements are there for me to be like, yes, I want this book. Um, But it just falls so flat. Um, So it's it's another case of sort of flat characters. Um, There's like no interiority to any of the the characters. Um, Everything is, it feels like the prose is very much at a remove from the action. So, you know, there's the the old old adage for writing, show, don't tell. This is like all tell, no show. Um, So it just ended up being extraordinarily dry and quite boring to read. Um, So skip the book go for the series if the premise sounds interesting to you. Um, I don't know how um, faithful the further seasons are. I've only watched season one. Um, Season one is fairly faithful, but I I get the sense that they kind of depart from the books quite a bit. There are three books um, and I have a feeling that's probably not a bad thing. (laughs) That's too funny. (laughs) <laughs> well, my next one is the one I know that you like, and many other people do as mm-hmm. well. You know, Reese Witherspoon read it, raved, optioned it, mm-hmm. starred in the film Wild by Cheryl Strayed. Strayhead? Strayhead? Strayed. Strayed. Oh, Cheryl. Um, <laughs> I just, when I first picked this up, you know, I, I was envisioning like wilderness saving her, you know, mm-hmm. the Pacific Crest Trail, and they're just she was just such a hot mess. I I just, you know, it was, Mm -hmm. I don't know, for those of you that haven't read the book, she's lost, did she lose her mom? I read it a while ago, you know, her, Mm -hmm. she pretty much sabotaged her marriage, you know, that Mm -hmm. ended. um, And it sounded like he was a pretty, pretty good guy, you know, experiments with heroin, um, decides on an impulse that she is going to hike this trail. But to me, it's like she was so unprepared to do mm-hmm. it um, and made so many stupid decisions. It's a wonder this woman was alive in my mind. And then, <laughs> you know, I think some of it, she actually wasn't able to hike. Like it wasn't, I was picturing like the man that walked on the app, like 
with Bill Bryson, you mm-hmm. know, the walking on the Appalachian. That's kind of what I was picturing. And it just felt very short for me. There were some scenes where she, you know, interacts with nature and everything. Mm-hmm. But to me, it was more like, I'm so hot. All these different people want to sleep with me. I, I, I don't know. She just, she drove me crazy. She drove me crazy. And um, I wasn't even sure, like in the end where she, you know, comes to this realization that she's okay, you know, who she is. And I'm thinking mm-hmm. to myself, what did you learn? I mean, you were so lucky you didn't die on that. I don't know. Yeah. I was a little, <laughs> just a little frustrated with it. Um, she didn't even read her book about how, how to survive in the wild. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Why did you like it? <laughs> I'm just gonna put you I right get to defend the all likers of this book. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, she was absolutely a hot mess at the beginning, 100%. Um, and I guess I had some empathy with that self destructive impulse um, of just for whatever reason, just that need to constantly pick at things until they get worse. Yeah. Um, so I, I definitely could sympathize with that. And then as far as the like sort of snap decision without all of the background, um, I that also that impulse also seemed very familiar to me. Like that is something, maybe not on this scale, but that is certainly something that I could see myself doing, being like, oh, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna put my mind to it and I'm gonna do it and get two days in and be like, well, I am in far over my head. <laughs> so I guess I I found her a more sympathetic figure. Maybe I was just, for lack of, too old. Like, you know, I, I'm looking at it from a viewpoint of I had teenage, well, now daughters in the, mm-hmm. the 20s. And I was thinking to myself, if they ever did <laughs> anything. Sure. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I get that completely. So, mm-hmm. yeah. All right, um, my last book is another classic um, that I picked up and for our Spring into the Classics Challenge. And um, I really thought I was gonna like this book a lot um, and I was wrong. And it is (laughs) The Man in the High Castle by Philip K. Dick, um, who is like one of the titans of American early science fiction. so this book was written in, got to check, 1962. Um, it was set contemporaneously and it's an alternate history of the United States and it's in the science fiction section, but I don't think that's really accurate. Um, there's no science fiction here. It's, it really is strictly an alternate history. Mm-hmm. Um, so in this alternate history, Um, the United States lost World War II. Um, So we lost to the Axis powers. Um, The United States has now been sort of divided in much the way that um, Berlin was divided Mm -hmm. after World War II. So um, the East Coast is occupied by Nazi Germany and the West Coast is occupied by Japan. So slavery is legal again. Um, So black folks are enslaved. Um, Being Jewish is still like a a life sentence essentially. Um, So any Jews who are still living in the country um, are living in hiding. Um, And in San Francisco um, where the book is set primarily um, like the Asian culture has sort of um, permeated everything. So the, there are several folks who use the I Ching um, to like decide basically to make all of their decisions, um, which is um, like a kind of fortune telling system, right? So it's fascinating, um, but it felt like a philosophical experiment more mm-hmm. than a novel. Um, so there is a little bit of plot, um, 
but the plot is kind of beside the point. Like it's all just an excuse for um, sort of conceptualizing what a world with these conditions would look like. Um, and the answer is it's pretty freaking bleak. Um, and I just, I don't know. I, I think I'm supposed to be like super fascinated by it all, but I wasn't. It just didn't, it didn't grab me. I didn't like, I didn't feel like I could sink my teeth into it. Okay. So. Meh. That's what I got. All right. So um, that's a few books that we didn't like. <laughs> um, as I said at the beginning, please do let us know if you've read any of these, what your thoughts are, or if you have books that you've read that just did not do it for you. Um, because, you know, one man's trash is another man's treasure. And I'm sure some of these books that we've talked about um, are going to be on somebody else's best of list. <laughs> right. What's that library saying? Every book, it's time. Every, every book, book, it's reader. reader. Every yeah. reader, their book. Yeah, yeah. for sure. So, um, yeah. And I just like to hear about the other ones that you didn't like as well. So, you know, dish about yeah. your, your books that you don't like or. Absolutely. And how often do we get to be like snarky about books instead right. of right. just talking about the things that we loved. So, <laughs> so please do let us know what you have thought. Um, and we will be back in two weeks with um, a roundup of some of the books that we've been reading, hopefully that we liked a little bit better than the ones yeah. we talked about today. <laughs> Definitely. All right. Thanks everybody. Happy reading and we will see you next time. Take care.